Welcome gamers to this one-off video of Field of Glory Kingdoms, which is coming out at time of recording today. So what I wanted to do is just do a one-off video as quickly as I can, because this is going to be about the sixth time I've tried to record this, uh, because I'm just spending too much time trying to uh, present what this game does. And the, the purpose of this video is for you you, the viewer, to decide if this is right for you. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present the dots, but you have to join the dots for yourself. Um, for example, I get a lot of questions about this game is, you know, how does it compare to Crusader Kings? How does it compare to Total War? Where does it fit? Do I need to have Field of Glory Medieval to play the game? Uh, what are the benefits of having Field of Glory Medieval? Do I need all the DLC of Field of Glory Medieval to be able to uh, play the game? Things like that. So we'll just quickly go through as fast as I possibly can to present the information. And so you can then try to make an informed decision. So hopefully this won't be too long and I'll just sort of skip through as much of this as I possibly can. Before I do get started, thank you for watching. And um, if you do like this sort of content, please uh, like and subscribe. It does mean a lot and it certainly helps with the dreaded YouTube algorithm. Let's just get straight into it. Villa Glory Kingdoms is a game with a number of different scenarios and a grand campaign. You see that most of the dates are starting around the 10 hundreds, which is just after the um, the Viking raids of the uh, of the 8 hundreds, and so we're sort of in the early high medieval period. Um, so we're not in the we're not in the Dark Ages. We're out of the Dark Ages, but only just. And so uh, this is just be aware. This is not the uh, late Middle Ages where we're sort of you know looking at at lots of firearms and cannons and and things like this. This is very much. Um, fairly rudimentary uh, knights on horseback, not the fully armoured um, knights that we sort of see in the in the late, to, like you know, the battles of Crecci or Agincourt. Those sorts of things are late in this period, not at the start. So anyway, that's just sort of like just to present it from a historical perspective. Let's go to the grand campaign. As I say, there's different. Uh, there's different. There's a tutorial which is great, uh, and then you also do have some sort of smallish in comparison to the actual game itself, some smallish uh, scenarios, and then the Grand Campaign. So the Grand Campaign starts anywhere from pretty much from the, um, you know, from Ireland, uh, Scotland, back up through here, uh, Norway, across through to the uh, Russian uh, chiefdoms and kingdoms. You can't play the chiefdom. They're sort of like, they're too small in their scope to really sort of for the game to um, to make fun with. So it's not really gonna sort of then work. You do have hordes that you can't play as, but can then sort of form into the Mongol horde later on in the in the game. Uh, you go down through the, uh, into like Persia. You don't extend across any, any further uh, west than, uh, sorry, east than, than, uh, than Persia. Uh, down into the Arabian Peninsula, you've then got sort of like the uh, the uh, the strongholds of the of the Islamic states. Uh, you've got the Byzantine Empire, which is in a state of collapse at this point in time. You could play as them and see if you can actually uh, you know pull a rabbit out of a hat and somehow save them. Um, but they're in, they're fragmenting at this at this stage. The game does an amazing job of modelling all sorts of different levels of uh, of of empire, uh, you know, from from lowly, uh, you know, as I said before, little chiefdoms, uh, all the way up to um, to massive empires like the Byzantine Empire. Um, you've got different kingdoms in through here. You can see there just how fractious um, all of Italy is in, in this in this period. So there's lots and lots of different st Italian states. Uh, France is actually a big collection of um, of independent uh, duchies and and counties as long, as well as uh, France. And so playing as one of the French locations you then you know your goal would be to try to form France which you can do similarly with Spain you've got the Reconquista uh, back in through here just about sort of just happening really at this point in time so you've got a lot of stuff going on in Spain uh, the Holy Roman Empire as well is sort of like is formed and they will help themselves all of these things play differently in the game like so no matter where you play uh, with, like with every with any, any faction there are some similarities but there's a lot of very very localized nuance and so if you're into the starting history in this period uh, you're going to love this game uh, it's, it's so much more detailed than any other game dealing with uh, with med the medieval period uh, in the sense of what it does do but it's not a historical it doesn't then follow his, a historical uh, track. Uh, it sets you a starting point, and from there, 
you can then sort of like guide your empire or your county or duchy or whatever it might be forward from that point. But the everything will then sort of happen much more in a simulation of what could happen rather than what did happen, if that makes sense. So it's it, it, it does it, it borrows a lot from history, but it doesn't actually push history. And um, that's also an important thing because I know some people love just having something that models history. Uh, this one starts you, but doesn't actually finish it. So uh, that, that's sort of, uh, I guess, one of the um, one of the little provisos how you might want to play it. Uh, England is just about to, um, you know, sort of potentially collapse, even though it's fairly strong. You've got Normandy again, just really sort of like getting ready to either go south and sort of take over France or north and take over England. We're still, uh, what, you know, 12 years away from the, from that invasion of England. Uh, and again, there are events that can trigger if certain things happen, but it doesn't have to. Let's choose one of the uh, French counties. We'll choose, uh, like if we choose, for example, Anjou, back and through here, uh, you can see that there's no there's no treaties anywhere else through there. But if we go to Berry, uh, we are actually a vassal of France. France has a few different vassals under their control. And so the game models this as well, like where they're, they're self-contained, like Champagne and uh, Berry, for example, are self-contained uh, duchies, but they actually are beholden to France. And then there's, there's sort of rules around how they would then operate. France would then be trying to, uh, well, first of all, protect against Normandy. You can see that um, Normandy is, is the, William the Conqueror is the ruler of Normandy with a royal marriage to England, which then gives it the um, the impetus to be able to then go and invade when, you know, if, if everything sort of then, you know, falls into line. England itself, for example, has got um, different vassals in through here and it's got royal marriages with Normandy, Wessex and Norway. So it sort of models these and the royal marriages are really just diplomatic connections that, that, that can give you reasons to then come and take over a particular a, a, a particular country uh if we go down and choose one of the other ones for example like the um you know this is the um the duchy of, of gascony back and through this other side uh we've got toulouse as well which is just a county but does control a lot of territory if we choose this one as an example i'll just use this one you know just to sort of present what the game has got and i'm going to be really just scratching the surface here this is really just is this a game for me <laughs> aspect um so we'll just go and play in here. I won't go into much detail. It does present a little bit of a history of each you know, faction that you are going to be then playing. And it does actually go through some important things that you may be wanting to focus on, which is fairly generic uh, throughout the game. So this is actually things to you know focus on your money, focus on your income. Don't sort of uh, run yourself into the dirt, things like that. Many starting factions will actually have very unique ways of playing. So if you play as one of the French, your goal is to, well, if you if you can become a king of France, uh, you'll find that you'll, you'll end up with some very strong-willed vassals. So if you're a if you're a, a duchy or a county, uh, you can f actually rise up and take over all of France and become the king of France yourself. Uh, but you then will actually have the French vassals will be strong-willed, which means that they can drag you into different wars. So there's a lot of little nuance that does go on through here. I won't go through all of this, but this is really, really cool. This happens in so many different areas of the game. So this is just purely if you're playing one of the French duchies, counties, or France itself. The game is very heavily focused on the regional or the uh, provincial management of your county, duchy, kingdom, empire, whatever it might actually be. And so that is really the prime focus. It is The prime focus is not the characters. The prime focus is not really the combat, but you can make it the combat. But the characters, it's, this is not Crusader Kings 3 point whatever. <laughs> the Crusader Kings is very much character driven. This is not at, at like, I won't say at all, because there is an aspect to it that may make it appear to be, but it actually isn't. So we'll get we'll get into that as well. I'll just to show you why. But this one is very much focused on the actual county itself. Let's just zoom in a little bit with this one through here. What you can see is we've got different regions back and through this other side. We also have a uh, an army, which we'll talk about in just a minute as to how they sort of operate. Uh, if we go to the different tool tips, we've got uh, like we've got ownership overlay, which is what we're seeing through here, just to give us a bit of a feel for who owns what. Uh, you can see that with the flags as well, like the little the little symbols will then sort of indicate that there's something else there. This one here, for example, is um, is uh, Bjorn, which is actually something that um, 
uh, that is part of the Gascoigne region and, and, and through here, but is actually a um, it's in, independent faction. Uh, so that one could be taken over by us. If we go back into one of ours, we then get to see other different things in through here. So, for example, this is uh, Tharbs, which is a part of Toulouse, which is who we are, and it's part of the Gascoigne province and so um and the, one of the things with the game is the provincial management so i will actually sort of show how that one does work the one underneath ownership overlay is the domains overlay or the province overlay this will then present the provinces if i just go and click somewhere else you'll sort of see that all of the gascoigne regions are colored this green color all of the uh, all of the Toulousian uh, province regions are colored a certain way even though we don't, we don't control uh, uh, Quercy we do control the others back and through here and if I go and click on a province like in through here in fact if I zoom out we can then see that this is the province of Toulouse the province of Gascoigne Aquitaine so we can then get a bit of a feel for the I guess the um, the manage the manage the larger management areas in the game. So if we go and click on Toulouse, any one of these little areas inside Toulouse, and I click it a second time, this is actually just the actual regional um, management. But if we click it a second time, we then can go to Toulouse itself, which is the provincial management area that we actually then have. This is actually where you can automate the game. So if you if you don't want to do management, you can then choose a focus for your populations. And these are the different pops. If I go and you can see that we're getting plus 53 gold, which is great. But I can actually just go to say, okay, give me a balanced... Uh, you know, spread of the populations. And you can see we've got food, uh, infrastructure, there's money, which we don't have anything in there. We have piety, which is back over through here. We have stewardship, which is sort of more your nobles, back into this other side. But if I just go and click on balanced, which is often what you would be wanting to do, you'll see that some have now been switched across to money. Our money just went up by a lot because, because we did that one. And we don't have, these three provinces are now the populations we don't have to micromanage that. That is now being managed by the AI in a balanced way. I could say, okay, no, we really want you to focus on um, on unit recruitment and units, and so it's not going to change anything because it's too early in the game. Uh, focusing on commerce, we get a few more, now getting even more money. It's not really worth it, though. Focusing on infrastructure for building, so if we want to focus on building, we could do it that way. Or focusing on food, that would be the expense of growth. Food will then sort of give us the, um, the the actual growth. So that way we focus on food. We're still getting a little bit of money back and through there. But if I just go to balanced, it will then sort of balance it out a little bit better. Similarly, back over here, this is actually the building slots. And this is actually a major, major focus of the game. To put this into context, there are hundreds of building types in this game, like literally hundreds. So I forget how many there actually are. Compare that to the other games. Um, you're not going to get anywhere near it. Uh, like this is just where the game is just exceptional, uh, just in, in terms of its detail. And this is really where the focus actually is. But again, if I don't want to be micromanaging that one, I'll just go to a balanced uh, view there. And it will then sort of go and, you know, it's making a shoemaker shop to make money. It's got a hemp field in one location, which will then sort of give us uh, hemp as a, um, as a trade good. Trade good we'll have to talk about as well. But this is sort of like an easy way to then manage your provinces. So having these, if you've got like a large empire, you may just want to have these on autom automation. If you've got like a small area, for example, like we also do control, if I just go back to province, the ownership, Toulousean County, we do control this one as well. But this is, I'm not, I don't own Gascoigne, so I can't do the provincial stuff with Gascoigne. What I have to have to be able to then manage these, I need to control the, the province capital, which is in Toulouse, which is what we're seeing through here, plus more than half of the, uh, or half or more of the actual regions within the actual province itself. Uh, if we go back into this one here, we then can micromanage. So this is actually one thing where you've, you know, we can go and build. I won't go through all the different detail. There's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> but this sort of starts you off with your different buildings back and through this other side. Uh, let's go with a local. Actually, it's going to cost me money. That will give me health, but at the expense of money. I don't like losing money in the early part of the game if I can help it. Uh, Pilgrim's Refuge gives us a lot of piety. We do get extra money as well. Oh, we'll go that way, <laughs> even though we uh, we lose a little bit of health because we, we're drawing people into the actual location. So 10 turns, and then that will be built. Now, the turns can be different in different um, scenarios. 
in this case, in the grand campaign, it's six months, essentially, is what we then end up having. So that's the province management in an absolute nutshell. Uh, in terms of um, of running the um, so region and province, uh, province management, one thing you'll notice when we do go back into provinces, there's a character here that no one's been filled in. This is actually, this is where people may think, oh, this is like Crusader Kings. You've got your character, your Count Henri, plus his court. And so you may be thinking, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in here with my role play and I'm going to be going off to other courts and finding spouses and all this sort of stuff. It doesn't happen in this game. This game really glosses over this aspect of it by design. It's, it's not designed as a Crusader King's um, you know, competitor in any sort of sense. Uh, it does actually have your local court, but the main aspect of this is to try to get stability through raising your family. So you do need to have like a stable heir. And in this case, he's only eight years old. So this is unstable. <laughs> and so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, and you can see there, the heir is, is Centul, uh, back and through here. And the actual, the, the, the chances of him being at a whole power if his father dies at this point in time, it's weak because others will rise up around him. So yes, there is this aspect of the interplay between the characters, but nowhere near as rich and deep as Crusader Kings. Uh, but it does actually still model it. So it's more of uh, how did we model this this period where where the court and the family were very, very important without actually getting bogged down. And so in this case, you've got relatives back and through here. If we go to loyalty, some of them have got suspect loyalty, like so Bosso de Reju is actually a um, is our brother who is actually uh, has only got 30 loyalty, which is very disloyal. So these may rise up. So these may cause a coup. So they, they still can play a role, but not a there's not a big central role with this. It does show up in through here. We've got three that have actually got low loyalty. And so these could form a coup against us. So we have to be just aware that that's actually happening. Uh, we do have other things we can do with these. We can, for example, do some things like in Crusader Kings, like we can assassinate and do different bits and pieces. And there can be repercussions from that one, but it's nowhere deep, as deep and rich as Crusader Kings, just to get that out of the way. Right, let's not spend any more time there. But these characters then do form the characters that you that use, for example, to go and place, you know, if we go to Bertrand de Rosis, he then becomes the the governor of these three provinces that we control. If we end up with Quercy, he would then manage that as well on our behalf. And he gets he gives us other bonuses as well because, because we've sort of chosen him. Now, his loyalty is unknown at this point in time. If he's disloyal as well, then we could have a big problem. He could actually rise up. Similarly, in our armies, the army is also, we've got uh, Clement uh, de Saint-Gilles in through here, which has also got suspect, we don't know the loyalty of this particular character either. And so these actually, the, the same characters that we sort of see in that court are the characters that we then actually have, um, you know, playing in the actual game itself. But these are not a central focus of the game. So just be aware of that. This is not Crusader Kings style. It's uh, it, it loosely uses the characters to create s scenarios and situations, but it's not very important. As I said before, the main thing will be managing the actual individual counties or the provinces and sort of how you then go and do that one. Uh, so I can go through. I don't have to have this guy. I can actually override what they're doing. I can go straight in and say, I don't want a hemp field. I want, to, uh, I want wood cutting instead. I can actually go and override the AI. To, um, to do what I need to do. Uh, big focus on this one is the trade and trade goods. Uh, again, I won't go into much detail with this one, but this is major uh, in the actual game. And it's it, you don't have to spend much time with it, but I think that this is one of these areas that um, for some players, this will be very, very rewarding for them to, to play in this sort of sense. And the color coding, again, with all of these different tool tips is really, really well thought out. And so, for example, if we've got green, it means we're doing okay. Blue, we're doing okay. You can see there with orange, that's pretty bad. Red means that they're really struggling. They've they've actually they're missing a lot of uh, of potential trade that they that they sort of need to then bring other goods in to um, to for to uh, f like to supplement what they're what they're needing in in the actual each province. And again, I won't, I'll do more detailed playthroughs where I go through how this actually does work but in, in an essence this is simply just a um, this is very very important in the game this is much 
cleaner than what it was in Field of Glory Empires, if you did play that game. That game was very convoluted with the way that, that trade works. Now you just need one good for one need, and you have to marry that up whichever way you can. And there's a whole other thing about, like, you know, with your the trade acumen of your leader. So there's a lot of, lot of things that are modelled in this as well. Like, it is very, very deep, but it's not role play deep if you know if you get what i mean uh but there's a lot of depth in in, in managing the actual different um trades or the different goods that do come through let's skip forward and now talk about armies and sort of how things actually will then go and work there so um actually before i do that one uh, we do have to build up our army one thing you will actually have in this game if i just go back out to i'll just keep it on the uh on the ownership overlay for now so let's go and take this uh, this independent fiefdom uh, back and through here uh, and we have an army which has got, uh, and it's only got 46 power. It's got eight units. Now we do actually have, like, there's three different types of units. There's only three different types of units in the game. Uh, there's many different unit types, <laughs> but three different classifications, I guess. One of them is a standing, like your standing army. Uh, one of them is your levies that you then sort of raise in, t in times of uh, trouble. And, um, and then also you've then got mercenaries as well. If you've got the money, then you can sort of grab mercenaries as well. And you get mercenaries typically from your provinces. And so the mercenary, the provincial mercenary that we end up having is the French mercenary archers is sort of what we end up at in, in this particular province. The other provinces will then have other different sorts of mercenaries available. So as you collect your provinces and as you as you do grow uh, you will find that you will end up having the ability to attract different types of mercenaries but for us uh, with Toulouse that's the mercenary type that we end up getting it's just these uh, mercenary archers uh, we can go and build also in the in the, from a province and you'll see there that the art uh, that they will be available the mercenary archers will be available to us in this particular build queue. Now, if we left click on these, we then get different detail about them. We can then sort of see that this is actually a ranged mercenary unit, which means it's going to cost us a fair bit of money, like 40 money to have one of these units, 52 to raise it. It doesn't cost us much in terms of manpower or or metal, but it does cost us a bit in, in equipment. But then the upkeep is purely money. So if you're rolling in money, then and like the Byzantine Empire, for example, will rely very heavily on mercenaries. Other other factions not so much. Uh, we also then have other different types of units. This is a raw early spearman. This is a levy unit. So this one is sort of raised. It's um, reasonably expensive to sort of keep in the field. Twenty four. Um, keeps eight manpower and two metal to keep that one in the field by the way you do actually have like a each faction has got a number of different units called its retinue which it doesn't actually pay the upkeep on so you do actually have like a, a, a core army uh, that you can then sort of develop so keep that in mind as well uh, beyond that you start to then pay these costs uh, in through here Mercenaries, you always pay the cost. Uh, so anyway, we've got that one there, which is just uh, basic uh, defensive spearmen. We do actually have sergeants, which are sort of like early early uh, knights. Uh, they're not sort of like the full-blown knights. We can sort of raise them. This is the other type, which is a standing army unit. What these are is expensive to recruit, but cheap to maintain. And so you've, but you've only got a certain number of those that you can actually then go and get. And if I hover over that one, actually, where is it? If I go and press... Um, is it control? Yeah, this is a standing army unit. You only have three of these at a given time. Now, that will depend on your faction. You can have more or less, but for us, it's three. Uh, and we already have two in the field. So we can get one more standing, standing unit. So we could grab one more of these if we wanted to. We then have early defensive spearmen in through here as well, which are better than our levied spearmen. These are uh, also standing units, so bringing these in, these are much better quality. But we to get that one, we need to have a fort built. So we need to have a fort built somewhere in the uh, in the province to to be able to get that one. Uh, this one here is a peasant militia, and this one requires a peasants roundup. So we need to have, find that building if we wanted to get peasants, which we probably probably don't really want. But these are cheap, really really cheap just to uh, sort of maintain an army of these. And then finally, we have the early French knights and sergeants. And so this is the start of the actual uh, knights that we then have available to us. And these ones require, again, forts to then be able to go and, uh, and build these. So we need to eventually build forts to be able to, uh, to start to recruit these type of units. And this is another standing, standing army unit. 
So th that's sort of one aspect of the actual f uh, uh, of the combat itself. Let's actually go and use this army. Let's go and build it up, because at the moment, and actually I'll just show you very quickly. Um, if you go to your summed abilities, the retinue allowance just then tells you how many you get for free of your standing army units or your um, levied units. Beyond that, you then have to pay the uh, pay the, the cost essentially for them. So uh, let's just go back out. And um, now to raise an army, as I said before, we can go sort of into uh, into the province and and raise it this way, where we actually then sort of pay the money, pay the manpower, pay the pay the metal, and start to bring units in. Uh, so, for example, we could go and, and grab these sergeants, which has cost me 74, 18, 10. So if I go and, uh, and, and right-click, I can add it to the queue. It'll take two turns for that one to come in, which is fine. Uh, or I can sort of go into an individual province and um, actually kind of do it there. Uh, yeah, I can do it from here as well. If I just go back out, just go into there again, go to... Um, into here, you can see there that we may have differences as well. Like we've only got light archers here, not the mercenary archers. They may be a better choice for us. They'd be a bit cheaper than the mercenaries, but they do cost manpower. We're getting plus 16 manpower, but let's just leave that one where that is. Uh, our actual army itself consists mainly of light archers, which are really just support units. So we do need more frontline troops. Now, we can either build them up with the with the different spearmen. We can also go across into decisions, which is very important. Uh, I'll just go and get some local units. These will be um, these units will not be mercenaries. That's just going to be more archers. If I go to here, we end up getting more spearmen. These ones will cost me fifty gold, twenty manpower, which I can I can afford. So let's go and uh, and just play that one there. And uh, we'll just end our turn, just so we can sort of uh, can show you the difference between this and, for example, Total War. By the way, the turns, you can see in the, in the top right-hand side there, it's processing the turn. It's a WeGo system. So you give all your orders, and then it processes a turn. This is why the game can be played very, very well as a multiplayer game. So it, it actually is, a, um, it is designed to play well that way uh, because of the WeGo system. So it's essentially turn-based, but not not each player having a turn. It's it, everyone plans their turn and then it plays out. Um, this is important, but I won't go through how it then works. You've got authority and you've got legacy. Legacy is your score in the game. You pretty much should ignore that. Um, I would suggest um, it really is just sort of where you position if you're going to win the win the game or not. But this is not really the focus of probably while you're playing the game. You're probably more focused on just playing and, and enjoying the um, you know what actually happens with the management of your of your kingdom, duchy, county, whatever it might be. Uh, over through here is your authority. You do need to this is very important to maintain as much authority as you possibly can. So I'll just go and click on OK. Um, okay, so we've got uh, an important character appeared. So uh, De Cominges is um, offering his service. Now that's just going to be another person has now come in. So um, this one here is um, actually his um, his offensive rating is better than the other other general. So he's a he's an offensive rating of two, and he's a guerrilla warrior. So an attack bonus of plus one for the entire stack, and a siege penalty. So each so he does he's not very good at sieges. Let's put him in charge of the army. So um, let's go and I'll just sort of show you how this one then goes and works. So there's no negative. Like if we go and click on the actual army itself, hang on, where are we? <laughs> Click on that army. There we go. So we've got the first Toulousian army, and we've got the second one, which we've just raised, which has actually got a couple of early armoured spearmen, which is actually pretty cool, and some light javelin men as well. So this is the little army that we just created. Let's go across to our main army, and let's go and replace Clermont de St. Gilles with, uh, with, the other, with the new character that's just actually come in, which is a two attack, one defence. So he's a better general, but initially you see there that these the um, actually these guys here may lose some of their experience when they go across the new general. Let's just see what happens. We're going to merge that one with the first, and yes, they lost one of one star, so one star of experience because it's gone to a new general. Now we've actually got uh, we're now going to have a drain on on different things because we've now got more characters here than what we are allowed to have. We have an allowance of um, of 10, but we've got 12. 
And so we should actually start to see military upkeep will now start, whatever the lowest amounts, it will then start to drain off because we're beyond the, t the 10. Anyway, that's just where we are. But this now is a much more powerful army. Let's just go and uh, let's go and raise it. And I'll show you the different ways of, um, of fighting. So it's going to take me two turns, so basically a year to march across. So let's just go across and select that again and right click. I won't go through all the different uh, bits and pieces into here, but let's just um, go that way. Um, so uh, we'll end our turn again. The game ultimately does play fairly quickly once you sort of get set up. And now that he's actually sort of you know had time with the army, he's now got the experience back with these units. So when you first bring a new general in, it can actually have a negative impact on your forces. But then we'll let, they'll then sort of sort of bring things bring things together. He's now going to move into this one, and then we can I can just show you the combat the way the combat works, and we'll do the comparison to uh, Total War. <laughs> So during the turn, you can see we're about a third of the way through the turn being processed. We now actually have a battle in Bjorn, and we've got a few different ways that we can actually process this battle. One of them is we can export the battle, or we can actually look at it in, in, in like inside the actual game itself. So this, if we go and view the battle, we're letting we're letting kingdoms run the battle. If we export the battle, we're going to then play in Field of Glory Medieval, and I will show that now, and we'll go back and show, I'll show you both uh, because um, they're both exceptional. In this case, it should be fairly one-sided. Like they're not. There's nine units there with another two, so they've got eleven units all in total. Uh, there's no. There's no protection around there. This area. There's not going to be a siege in any sort of sense. So let's just go and export the battle. Now what this will do, if you do own Feel the Glory Medieval, and if you're watching this at the time that the game is launching, I would bet that, uh, and I don't know, but I would bet that Feel the Glory 2 Medieval will be on special. <laughs> so grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. So um, this is sort of then, we export the battle, uh, overwrite exported battle, yes. And so it's then telling us what's going on where it's exporting it out to Medieval. This is clunky AF. <laughs> It's just really, really clunky, but it's just the way it does work. Uh, I would love it if just medieval was just part of the game, but it's not. Uh, so anyway, this is the way. This is um, like people ask me this a lot when I show this game. Is what? Why is it doing that? Like, why is it? Why is it? Why do we have to go to a different game? It's because there's different companies that sort of built the games. They work very closely, but they're not the same company. Now you don't need all of the. Uh, so I'll just go and play medieval. Um, so we're now opening up Medieval, which is a different system, a different game entirely. But this is Byzantine games. The other one is Agion games. So Field of Glory 2 Medieval is purely a battle. Com it's a combat, a medieval combat system. So you can use Field of Glory Kingdoms as your campaign generator to then play out the battles. I love this game, by the way. I love both games. Uh, and I really enjoy being able to play those battles out in this particular game. If we just go across into battles, by the way, when I'm in here, look, if you are trying to, if you're thinking of playing the game and thinking, I wonder, you know, I feel like playing with, um, with some, uh, you know, some, some Huskals or something like that. You, you may sort of think, okay, look, I really want a particular style of fighting in kingdoms, but I'm not sure what they all come with. You can use this game to, to, to get, a bit of a um, a bit of an idea as to what will actually be playable in the different factions. So if you go across, this is not kingdoms, but I'll just it's a bit of a tip. If you go across into battles and go into a custom battle, and you then filter like if and look again, you don't need the DLCs to be able to do this. But if you go into pick your army, and if we choose the dates to go from uh, like one thousand to one thousand one hundred, which is our starting dates or even 1,200, for example. We're going to get different types of um, of factions coming through. So, for example, Anglo-Irish is outside of the scope that we're in. If we just go back to 1,100, we don't get Anglo-Irish. But we do get other things. Now, our starting time is 1059, I think it was. And so, in this case, um, we could have a look at the Andalusians. What do they have? If we go and click on that one, and then click on this preview army options, we can then sort of see what style of uh, combat they're going to have. They've got knights and sergeants. 
Uh, they've got Muslim lenses. So this is a really interesting one because it's actually a combination of um, of you know in, in, like you know, European style um, uh, forces as well as Muslim style forces. So that's and that's playing as Andalusia. Just go and close that one off. Um, you know, if we were choosing for something like the Danish, for example, in the 1050 aspect, and have a look and see what they've got. They've got Huskals, mounted Huskals. So they've got the mounted Huskals back and through there. So these ones, uh, these use an axe when dismounted. So you get a bit of a feel for the actual loadouts that you actually have. If we go back out again, now I don't know if Toulouse would probably just be, I would guess, under. Um, yeah, it's not actually separate in here. That would just be considered one of the French. Uh, so we have a look at the French in through here, 1050. And so we should see very similar sort of style, uh, like the army groups. Knights and sergeants, we've got low country spearmen back and through there. Armoured spearmen, defensive at this point in time. Raw spearmen, crossbowmen, light archers, light javelinmen. So we're seeing a few of these sorts of units coming in with what who we're playing as. But this will give you a feel for the different types of units that you could expect to see playing different factions. Anyway, that's just a little bit of a, an aside. I did want this one to be fairly fast. If we go to Kingdom's Battle, that will then load in the battle that we were just playing. And so this, as I said before, this is um, like if you're playing Total War, comparing this to Total War, this would be the um, the closest comparison by, by bringing it into into um, into Field of Glory 2 Medieval and play the battles out here. It's going to give you a similar sort of experience to um, playing it in Total War, except it's turn-based, not, um, not real-time. Uh, and... For me, this is a much cleaner way of playing. You can see it's sort of now, we can change the uh, lay, you know, the loadout of where all the troops actually are. So I can reposition these um, all the way across. We've got like a lot of um, lot of our forces in the, in the rough. Um, just move these across. We've got our knights and sergeants sort of in the middle through there. And so there, this would be then be the force that would then sort of bring through. Don't know why the armored spearmen would be so far back. Let's just move them up. Uh, sometimes you're going to have different other other generals you can bring in. Let's just bring them up as well. All right. So if that was going to be our force, for example, in this particular battle, we can then just end our turn. Are you sure? Yes. And then we have the enemy forces on the other side there. Now I'm thinking that this group in through here would be more heavily armoured, and um, yeah, we're not seeing much in the way of of big armour. So if we sort of then played it effectively we may sort of then be able to use the knights on this flank and so you end up playing like a full-on um, you know tabletop style which is why again the graphics uh, are like what they look like um, they, they reflect the tabletop version of the game this is a computerized version of that one so you can play these ones out very much where you are in sort of like um, you know getting the different units to um, to perform in the battle itself. So it's played turn by turn. Uh, but let's actually now, let's not play this out. I just wanted to show that, yes, you do actually have the option to play full-blown battles in kingdom uh, in kingdoms, by, but only if you've got medieval. So this is only if you've got the other game. So look out for it. It should be on special, hopefully, at time of launch. Uh, let's go and quit out of this particular game. Because uh, even if we, um, like, if I, I'm supposed to then play that out and then go back to kingdoms again and import it back in. So once I've finished the battle, it will then prompt me to say, okay, look, you know, you, you can go back to kingdoms now with that result. It will then bring that result in. And so we can then import, but we didn't actually finish off the battle. But that one, we can import this one back in. Or I can just go back in and load. I do actually have, the game will then save a pre-battle turn three. You can see it's got the auto save uh, turn three, but I do actually have a pre-battle. If I go to that one there, I go back in time to where the battle starts. So let's go and load this one in. This will then take us back to the point where we could export the battle out. And so, um, and so yes, you can keep on replaying different things if you're wanting to. But in this case, and this is like an auto battle system. Uh, so this, um, if you don't like the battles uh, and you just want to have them auto done, then this, you can just purely play completely in kingdoms. You can just view the report. You don't even have to look at the battle itself. But it does have a nice way of actually playing the battle out in its auto battle system. And so if we go and view the battle, it has a number of different ways of playing it out. This is the same scenario that we saw there before. Now, you can see there that we've only got two sergeants rather than three. Um, the other game 
sort of abstracts things to a certain degree and rebalances it. So the, the two development companies have tried to find really clean ways of getting a, um, a, a more balanced view of what's going to happen in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the medieval battle system rather than the kingdom's battle system. This is the kingdom's battle system here. And this one starts off essentially with what it does is it has a range phase. All the different range units will then attack everything else. And they're trying to exhaust the others. So these all, look, some of these got, uh, like this one's tired, it lost uh, a couple of effectiveness. These are exhausted, they've lost all of their effectiveness, they've still got all their hit points. Uh, these took a little bit of a, 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 a beating back and through here. After that, what then happens is the, uh, the forces then um, are, are then played out against each other. So if we go and play this one here, it then becomes a battle of... Um, uh, the total rank ranking, so this is the uh, the raw early spearmen against our early armoured spearmen. And so we have, uh, like the, these who happen to have the same combat rating. It's going to come down to die rolls. Because this one's got two attack, we end up with um, with two extra die rolls. And it's whatever the, whatever the biggest number is. So it's a very simple system. And so we actually ended up doing a couple of extra things. This In this case, we did one hit point, one effectiveness. Uh, we're okay where we are. So that was actually a good result for us. Back and through here, we're now going to be charging into these javelins, which should be very, very weak. So we've already got a three advantage in here, and yeah, we sort of that should kill them off. Yep, that's destroyed them, and it just goes through line by line. And so in this case, they're even. We happen to roll again because of our general having more rolls than what the enemy has, is going to work out a little bit better. These are not going to do too much. There we go. So we're doing it fairly well. Let's wipe them out. And so the different classes also then have different abilities. This has been good for us. And that should be the end of it. And so if we, if one side dominates the other, it will then go into like a pursuit mode where they'll then sort of be run off the actual field itself. And so this has already been played out essentially. So we've destroyed the whole thing. We won the battle, and that's how fast the battles can be done inside the game. So typically, if we wanted to play out a battle in medieval in the other game, uh, it's, it may take up to about half an hour to play the battle, whereas in this case, it's it split seconds if we just go straight to the result, or we can actually then go and um, uh, you know have a look and see what actually happened. How well, what were the die rolls? And what, that's what we looked at through there. We've now actually gotten the Toulousian County now it also consists of still processing the turn, but that is now the battle system. So that sort of presents, I guess, the way that the game is structured and played um, in terms of, of combat. Um, I'll just let it go through. But there's so much more in this game. Like there's so much. It's so much deeper and richer than both Crusader Kings and uh, Total War in its own way. Like it's, it, it certainly is, um, the battle system is, is, is as detailed as Total War's battle system. I would argue it's better than Total War for the simple reason that it's, it's much more involved in the actual, in, the, in that tabletop system, rather than just the, you know, roll, like dragging different forces around in real time. I find this so much more engaging. Anyway, that's sort of, uh, we've now taken over Bjorn. This has now become one of our provinces. We do have different rules we have to play with as well. We can't just go off and attack uh, anyone we like. We do need to have claims. And so that does bring in <clears throat> diplomacy does play a role. Like if I go and click on Gascony, for example, and then have a look at, at diplomacy, I've got a number of different things I can then go and do with diplomacy back and through here as well. So there's a whole lot of different stuff like proposing a transaction, um, you know, give metal, give seed region, whatever it might be, like cooperation. Uh, so we sort of try to become more friendly with someone, for example. Uh, we can, um, if I just go back out, um, so just got changes, yes. If I go back in to the, um, just go back to Gascoigne again. So we can ask for an alliance, um, yeah, insult them to try to sort of get them so that we end up with claims against them, things like this. So there is actually a fairly rich um, diplomacy system. It's fairly simple, but it is fairly rich with what it can actually then go and do. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to like about the game. This is uh, by default when we go to diplomacy, it will then go and choose the political overlay, which will then give us a bit of a feel for what people think of us. So zero is um, is is fine. France likes us. Twenty five. Um, Scotland may. No, nope, there's zeros. 
So, um, and so, you know, and there, there may be some enemies as well. Like you can see there, the, the Muslim states of Spain are, ne are slightly negative towards us. Um, I don't know if they'll get even worse as they go back towards Mecca. Yeah, negative two. They don't probably don't really know much about us at all. Yeah, it's negative two back in, in through there. But that's um, that's sort of, and over time, uh, yeah, the interplay between the different factions will then sort of start to uh, to kick in as well with these with these little scores as to what they do think of you. Anyway, I won't spend too much more time. But I just wanted to give a bit of a feel for, um, you know, the complexity of the game. I guess the focus of the game, uh, where it sits in you know in comparison to Crusader Kings, which I really got to say it's not not even close to it. Uh, and also against Total War, and I got to say it is very close in terms of the what you can do with the combat, but Compared to both those games, this game is so, so, so much more detailed in terms of its actual province development. Um, like if we just go back, I'll just quit back out of there, actually. Sorry, I'll just yeah, go back out of that one. And I'll just go back into here, for example. The, the, the overall management of your regions and building up, for example, we've only got a spear maker here, but eventually if we could get, you know, as I said before, there a fort or something like that, uh, you know, that will then sort of give us more units. It, it's so much more detailed than the other two games in this in this aspect. Um, it's It can be complex, but and there's a lot that you can do uh, with the game itself. By the way, another tip I will give you is um, really make use of the uh, of the freely downloadable manual. Now, there's a link on the Steam page to this. This is an incredible manual. This is Again, one of the best manuals that I've come across. Um, it's 300 odd pages and the information, it's very, very well written. It really does go through all of the detail in the game itself. And it's, it's actually, again, a good read. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, download it onto your tablet and just, you know, read it, <laughs> read it at your leisure um, as a book almost. It's, uh, there's so much different things, but it's got, you know, this faction specific rules, you know, how different things sort of then go and work. Um, yeah, it, it just covers so much detail. Uh, with what actually does go on with the actual game itself, so this and it's said three hundred odd pages here. There's a lot of a uh, lot of content in here, uh, presented very very well. And so you can download that even before you buy the game, and just have a look and see. Yeah, is this a sort of um, is this a sort of uh, game I want to be playing? We didn't even cover the way that the actual civilization tiers work. Uh, this is such this is genius what they've done with this as well. That's just as you sort of level up through. The, um, through your um, authority, you then can sort of start to build your own uh, empires a little bit, or your civilization tiers, uh, which is very, very cool. Uh, just the whole thing is really just amazingly good. Uh, there's just so much detail in the game, but um, this will give you a um, this is a good compendium to actually sort of keep uh, near you. Uh, by the way, inside the game itself, every single screen uh, will have a little question mark which will then give you detailed information uh, relating to that screen look at all this information that we have different stuff about buildings populations um, the jobs that they, that they actually have and how that sort of is impacting different things uh, there's just so much you know like it's it really just goes on and on and on the different classes of buildings and so even if you're not looking at the manual you do actually have this amazing system in in the game itself you do actually have a whole lot of ledges as well um, in the game so there's heaps of these like you know regions of population their military abilities um, the trade goods so getting an overview of as to what trade goods they have uh, your armies, how they're performing. So this this will help with management as well, the different characters. So you've got all these different summaries. And again, the game just does such a good job of these. Um, so you've got all these available. There's just so much to cover. This is the, um, we're Christian Catholic, but if we go and click on that one, this is actually, it's a whole other aspect of the game again, where you've got the different uh, the different religious councils and, and what that can then mean. You can end up very easily with um, different crusades or jihads or whatever else you know, might be happening in through here. Uh, you've got the papal states, which we're controlled by. Uh, and sort of where different things do come from. It's uh, very, very cool, the whole thing. And again, if we go to info, we're then going to have very specific information about the different aspects of how these all sort of then go and work. Um, it's just, it's brilliant what this, what's been done with this particular game. Uh, there's just overall diplomacy back and through there. If you go and click on that one, it's just, you know, whether we've got treaties, uh, wars, requests or whatever it might be so that's just another sort of air aspect in through there but I, I really can't recommend this this game highly enough um it is not crusader kings it is not total war 
uh, it, in my opinion, it is much, much more focused on the um, on the on the empire management side of things than both those games. And not just by a little way, I mean by a big, big margin. It is really quite amazing. I would love to see more scenarios. I would love to see more grand campaigns that start at a later date, like 100 years you know, beyond this date. Unfortunately, at that period, most of these smaller counties then have become you know, sort of collected up into, uh, into larger entities like, you know, um, you know, France and England and things like this, but you could still actually play it within the Vassal system. I would love to see more content. I would love to see a, uh, a, 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 a you know, the Songs of Ice and Fire, like the um, um, yeah, Game of Thrones. <laughs> I would love to see a Game of Thrones mod. And the and the game, like the game, is moddable. Uh, the, there's everything is exposed. Most things are inside, um, almost like text files, like comma separated value type type things. So you can. You can like if if someone was interested enough, they would be able to build their own their own mods. It was certainly within the map system it's got. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, it, I think it's going to be a great great game. I really hope this game does well because um, I, I love it. I love what it does do. I love the I love the scope of what it does do. It is it is on the higher end of the complexity scale, but you don't have to. You can play it automated to a large extent you don't have to get sort of uh, too bogged down unless you want to and then it's really really rich and rewarding in the in the sense if you do get bogged down into the into the minutiae the minutia and detail anyway guys i'm going to leave it there i'm sort of already gone i nearly i wanted this to be about 20 minutes long and we're now nearly uh, we're heading in towards an hour long i'm going to leave it there because there's so much more i could cover in this game there's so much more that this game does um it is brilliant it is abs it's a it's a work of genius it really is it's um it extends upon uh, empires in, in great ways, and it really is very different to other games in this in this genre. It's so much more detailed than uh, those other games, but not so much. Crusader Kings, you've really got to separate away because that is much more about role play and characters, and this game is not. This game is much more about empire and um, and regions and developing up your regions, and then sort of getting like you know getting the forces that you need to to. Um, to do diplomacy by other means. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like the content, and uh, I'll catch you next time.